Well, hey everybody, this is Joe Van Cleve. Welcome to another episode of the Typewriter Video Series. Hey, it's Sunday afternoon on a hot June day here in Albuquerque. Good day to be indoors with that swamp cooler running or whatever kind of air conditioning you might have. Today's video, I think I'm going to do a little bit of a follow-up video on the Roy Portable Typewriter. When I did the original review video a few weeks ago, there were a few things I didn't want to touch on quite yet until I had more experience using the typewriter. And so today, after several weeks of use and playing around with different things on it, I think I'm going to just talk about some more aspects of the Roy Portable Typewriter. All right, so... Uh, one of the things that uh, I've talked about with my fellow typewriter conspirator, Kevin, here in Albuquerque, we, we've met several times. We've talked about ultra-portable typewriters, which we would classify typewriters like the Roy and the uh, Hermes Rocket and other kind of really small typewriters. But, you know, the term portable typewriter was definitely a, an, an official industry term back in the heyday of the, of the manual typewriter. But... We really don't think ultra portable was used back then. I think it's come to be a term of art in the uh, post typewriter era, in the, in the typosphere era. Somebody, I don't know who, maybe one of you uh, historians out there can tell us who started using the word ultra portable. Might have been Richard Polt, as far as I know, because I think it was in his book. We do uh, think that the Roy is an ultra portable typewriter, but it begs the question of how do you measure that and one of the ways you could do it is either by size or by weight now measuring it by weight would be pretty easy to do obviously put it on a scale and then you'd have to classify a bunch of different typewriters by weight and figure out what the cutoff point is between portable and ultra portable for instance but if you're going to measure uh, typewriters by size and then classify them as portable or ultra portable it gets a little bit more complicated uh, first of all, you have three dimensions, obviously, length, width, and height. And then there's also volume, which is multiplying those three dimensions together. So perhaps there is some volumetric equivalent to an ultra-portable uh, above which it becomes a portable, maybe. One thing is for sure, though, when you compare the three dimensions of the Roy typewriter with the, for instance, the Hermes rocket that I have in my collection. It, it's an interesting comparison because there's two different sizes you have to talk about. It's the stored size, that is the size with the typewriter folded up or put it in its, put in its case for storage. And then there is the size of the machine when it's deployed in actual use. And in the case of the Roy, those two values are considerably different from each other in terms of the height of the machine. Well, here is the Roy typewriter and the Hermes rocket side by side, looking down from above. As you can tell, the Roy is bigger in both length and width than the Hermes rocket. But when you look at them in their stored condition with the rocket with its lid on and the Roy with folded up, you'll see the Roy is definitely quite a bit shorter in the height dimension. With the rocket being about three and five eighths inches high and the Roy being about one and seven eighths inches high. So again, this raises the question of how do you measure size? What is the critical dimension? Well, in my way of thinking, I think the Roy probably has an advantage here in terms of its stored thickness or thinness because it enables you to slip it into tight little areas to store it, whereas the extra, extra inch or so in its uh, width and length doesn't seem, I think, to make it as big of a problem as for storing it. For instance, most shoulder or messenger bags are large enough to accommodate the Roy's uh, dimensions, but the thinness of the Roy makes it just easier to slip into one of those bags and not be as thick. Now, however, a different tale is told when we deploy the typewriters in their used positions. So I guess I'm going to have to treat the carriage return lever height, which is going to be, in the case of the rocket, about three and a quarter inches. You have to take into account the carriage return lever's height. And in the case of the Roy, it's about four and three eighths inches. 
But you can see overall the body heights of both of them certainly gives the advantage to the rocket as far as being compact. I think where it comes down to in the terms of ergonomics, you'll have to decide for yourself, however, which of these two is more ergonomic. Yes, the rocket is a thinner machine, but look how close to the table surface the space bar is in relationship to the Roy, which requires you to lift your hand, uh, your wrist a little bit higher off the table. Is that more ergonomic for you? It's hard to say. It depends on your particular likenesses and the way your, your body is built. But another aspect of this uh, whole height thing I will mention here is let's look at the slope of the keyboards. Here we see the two machines situated side by side pointing at each other and the height from the top of the space bar to the top of the back row of keys in the case of the Roy is about an inch, there's about an inch, maybe inch and an eighth. Whereas with the rocket, from the top of the space bar to the top of the row of keys is closer to an inch and an three eighths to an inch and a half. So it looks to me like the rocket is certainly tiered steeper than the Roy, even though its space bar sits closer to the, sur to the uh, tabletop surface. One of the other differences between most uh, US keyboard ver versions of typewriters and this particular sample of the ROI happens to be in the keyboard configuration. This, of course, being an Azerty keyboard in the French configuration. So it took me a while to get used to it, and I think I can switch back and forth now pretty easily between an American QWERTY and this Azerty keyboard. So the good and the bad, as far as I've found, first of all, I like the lowercase apostrophe because I, I find when I write I do a lot of contractions and needing apostrophes and not having to shift for an apostrophe is a really good thing. I also like having the semicolon and the colon both as lowercase characters. I find that very convenient also. But the things I don't like about this keyboard other than the fact that the uh, AZ, QW, and the M are in a different location from an American keyboard, is all of your number keys are uppercase. They have, they're shifted, and you notice there's no number one or, nor a number zero. So when you're typing a date like, for instance, the year 2018, you're going to go shift to shift O for a uppercase zero, unshift for the L for the 1, and then shift for the 8. So there's a lot of shifting and unshifting to write a date, which seems a little bit uncomfortable. The other thing I find a little bit uncomfortable is the fact that the period is an uppercase. It is a shifted period. Uh, and, but other than that, I find overall it's, it's not a bad keyboard to get used to. Let's talk about stability of the typewriter on a tabletop surface. Now, of course, I have this on a p padded, carpeted surface, but I've added uh, neoprene rubber feet to the bottom of this typewriter. The original feet were worn off, and this is really stable. I, can hard I can't even hardly get it to move. And certainly when I'm doing a carriage return, there's no problem. I don't need to worry at all about having to brace the other side of the machine with my right hand when I do a carriage return. It just is rock solid and stable even on a hard smooth surface. So that is a really good thing. It's a really nice stable configuration. And if you are going to glue these little rubber neoprene feet on to the old feet, I would advise using epoxy instead of Gorilla Glue. I had one of these come off after using Gorilla Glue but epoxy seems to hold really nicely. The single biggest detriment to this particular sample of Roy typewriter is the hard condition of the rubber platen roller. It is really rock hard and it m makes for a very loud typing sound, meaning that you don't really want to use this in public at all. And also it makes the imprint faint and also ma makes a lot of cut throughs on the back of the paper, even the back of a backing sheet of paper, it breaks through very easily. So uh, I've been experimenting with different alternative materials to use as a backing sheet 
First of all, I tried using, of course, two sheets of paper. One is the typing paper, one is the backing paper. It does give you a slightly better imprint, but it does not help the sound at all. It's still very loud. Then I went to three sheets of paper, two backing sheets and the front sheet for typing on, and it does make it even slightly better in terms of imprint, but doesn't really help much with the sound of it, and also begins to introduce some feeding issues. It doesn't want to grip the pressure roller very well because the inner middle sheet wants to slip. Then I began using this sheet of 4 mil polyethylene plastic. I used it behind uh, the top sheet of typing paper and it works pretty good. It does dampen the sound somewhat and makes the imprint darker. I also tried using it in behind two sheets of paper like this. Two sheets of paper in front with the plastic in behind. It does have a little bit of feeding issues or threading issues, but what I found actually works pretty good is if you sandwich the plastic film between a front and a back sheet of paper. Now we're talking thin typing paper. We're not talking really thick copy paper, but uh, this is thinner type of paper, but sandwiching the plastic film between two pieces of paper seems to be a pretty good solution. and uh, it. It does require, however, just a little bit of patience when you're first threading it into the machine. You may have to release the pressure roller when you're feeding it in. It helps to get the plastic film even with the top edge of the paper. But I have to push it all the way down. And then sometimes it won't grip. You have to release the pressure roller. Then it gets started. So it's a little bit rough to start initially. but. It types pretty darn good. It makes a pretty dark imprint. Of course, I have typographical errors there, but nice and dark, and the sound is rather muted. I think it's a pretty good solution. However, you guys know me well enough to know that I always have to experiment with other ideas, and so I went on the internet and I went looking for thin sheets of neoprene rubber and I found this. This is a 1 32nd inch thick or thin sheet of neoprene rubber. It comes in a size of 12 inches square and I've cut it down to 8 and 3 quarters by 12 inches. So it's a light, for an 8 and a half inch wide sheet of paper, it gives you about an eighth inch margin of rubber on either side. It is narrow enough to feed into the carriage of the Roy typewriter. And let me show you several caveats. First of all, this rubber sheet is really grippy, real grippy, and dirt and dust likes to stick to it almost like glue. So it gets dirty real easily. And secondly, it has quite a distinctive rubbery smell. Uh, if you leave it in the office here, it'll smell like you have a tire, a car tire sitting in the office. So it has a kind of a chemically rubber smell. But what I found um, I have to do here is you've got to definitely get the top edge of this lined up with the paper in order to feed it. Then you definitely have to push it down all the way into the bottom and sometimes it won't catch until you release the pressure on the platen and kind of get it started. And then it will start, sometimes it starts a little crooked and you have to release the tension on the pressure rollers. But keep in mind that this rubber is very grippy and it wants to stick to the pressure rollers and the platen. So it's a little tricky to thread into it. Now my paper is a little crooked, but I'm just going to use that. Okay, let's go ahead and do a test typing, shall we? Now I don't know if you can tell comparing the sound with the plastic film, but it is definitely quite a bit more muted of a tone. It doesn't have that hard-edged clacking sound as much as it did before. Now, there is, uh, however, a caveat to this whole thing, and that is back here. If the top of the rubber sheet is in contact to the bottom part that's coming out of the platen, they have a tendency to stick together. And when you do a carriage return, 
it'll feel like the machine is jammed. It doesn't want to do the carriage return. So sometimes what you have to do is before you do the carriage return, at the end of your line, you have to peel back this top part, make sure it's not sticking, and then it'll do a carriage return. It'll advance the line evenly. And the same thing if you want to advance the line manually with a platen knob. You have to pull the rubber sheet up, make sure it's not sticking to the back one, because it has kind of a stickiness to, to it. It's very grippy. But it really works well, and as you can see, it has a really nice dark imprint, at least as good as the sandwich of plastic between two sheets of paper. So as far as using a backing material, it's really a draw between this thin sheet of rubber and a sandwich of two sheets of paper with a sheet of four mil polyethylene in between, at least for this typewriter and for my experiments. I think the sound is definitely dampened quieter with the rubber sheet, but it's a little more fiddly when you want to do a carriage return or a line, a line feed uh, just because the two parts of the rubber sheet might stick to each other and then you have problems. So there is that and that's something I'd encourage you guys to experiment with. Um, so the other thing about this machine that I liked better than I thought I would initially is now this is a carriage shift machine. And most carriage shift portables you're using, of course you're using your pinky finger, the small, the weak finger of either hand, but you're generally lifting up the weight uh, of the entire weight of the carriage when you're shifting. Well, this machine, you're not actually lifting the entire weight of the carriage at all. Instead, what you're doing is it's pivoting the carriage. It's rotating it about a central axis, so the back of the carriage is going down while the front of the carriage is raising up, which raises the front or print position enough to make the shift operation. So you really aren't lifting the weight of the carriage, you're simply uh, rotating against some spring tension, which makes it essentially just as light as a basket or segment shift machine, which is the same kind of force. You're pushing it down against a spring tension. So my general impressions, well, I find that at least this sample of the Roy typewriter that I have, and keep in mind they're fairly rare, it requires you to type a bit more slow and methodical in order to get a neat imprint. And one reason is because if you type too fast you can get uh, one type bar interfering with another and you miss a letter. And I've had it happen repeatedly and it might be my technique, but at least for me I have to hit it a little bit snappier, a little bit slower and methodical in order to get a consistently good sample. Secondly, because of the condition of the platen you really need some backing material behind the paper in order to get a decent imprint, even with a new ribbon I found. So it's not nearly as satisfying as, for instance, uh, my Royal Quiet Deluxe Adobe Rose, which has such a dark imprint. It's almost intrinsic to that machine, regardless of what ribbon. So some typewriters are just that way, it seems like. I find that fiddling with uh, the backing sheets is kind of an inconvenience. And this is, again, just a compromise uh, that I'm having to deal with until I decide to get the platen recovered with fresh rubber. Another thing is somebody, um, a number of people have mentioned the trick of rolling a backing sheet of paper or even a thin sheet of plastic around the platen and so, you, so that you don't have to put a backing sheet behind every sheet of paper. This gap between the top surface of the platen and the paper table you just can't roll a, a sheet of paper through there very easily. It's set to be very tight. So that precludes you from wrapping the platen in a roll of paper or plastic film. Also, in terms of uh, my impressions, uh, generally the loudness of this machine, unless you're using this sheet of thin rubber, the loudness of the machine does kind of detract from its portability. And what I mean by that is one of the aspects of a portable typewriter is because you can carry it different places, you might be more apt to carry it into public places. Well, you're a little bit less apt to want to use this machine in public because it's so loud. But again, this is really a function of the, this particular sample of typewriter I have, its age, condition of the platen, and it would of course be different if I decide to get it resurfaced. So in conclusion, I've, you know, I've really enjoyed 
owning this typewriter. It was different. It's a different machine. It's fairly rare. Never seen one before. Just watching people's expressions when you unfold the typewriter for the first time and they see this thing grow into twice the thickness and become a normal portable typewriter, that is always fun to watch their reaction. It has been a challenge though working with this typewriter and trying to make it a little bit more usable given its not only design limitations but of course the condition the limitations, condition of the platen mainly. That being said though, it's been a fun experience. I've done things now in terms of experimenting with backing sheets behind my typing paper. I've done more of this experimenting than I have before. This machine has kind of forced me to do that. And I certainly think amongst all my portable typewriters, this still is one of the better ones to take out and about. I didn't really mention the issue of weight, but it is a light typewriter. It doesn't weigh that much. It's certainly lighter than one of my brothers. And so that is a mitigating factor also in spite of the sound. And you know what? Some of my brother typewriters, though they're not quite as loud as the Roy, they still make quite a clacking noise. And so there is always that to consider. It's not like the Royal Quiet Deluxe here. Oh, by the way, I tried rolling that sheet of rubber into the Royal Quiet Deluxe. Oh man, that thing is quiet. You can hardly hear the thing. And look how dark it is. That is amazing. Well, anyways, this is Joe Van Cleve just with a little update on the Roy Portable Typewriter. What a fun machine this has been to own. Hope you guys enjoyed this, and until next time, have yourselves a great day.